Hi everybody and welcome to tonight's webinar, Return to Rowing for University Be Beginners. Um, I'm James Andrews, I'm Head of Performance Talent and I'll just be doing a short introduction before I pass you over to some of the other speakers tonight. We've got um, Pete Shepherd, who's Chief Coach of the Under 23s and Juniors. We have Sarah Harris, who's our Head of Education and Training. And we also have Paul Lorenzato, who is Head of Community Development. Um, if at any point you'd like to ask questions, we'll be having questions after each of the segments uh, tonight. We'll be looking at uh, our new document, which we released a week ago, which is Managing a Beginner Program. We'll be looking at top tips of coaching for coaching. And we'll also be taking some questions from everybody about uh, any COVID related questions about our guidance, as well as a few quick updates at the end of the webinar. Um, if you would like to ask questions, there is a question box somewhere in the panel. If you're on your phone, there should be a little question mark symbol. I think you can you can ask questions there. Or if you're on a computer, there should be a, a box to the side. Uh, so please feel free to ask any any questions there. Um, I will stop rambling on and um, I'll pass you over to our first speaker tonight, who's uh, Peter Shep. Uh, so Shep, there he is. Shep, I will hand over to you. Uh, good, good evening, everybody. And uh, thank you very much for your time this evening uh, and the opportunity for myself to just talk to you about how you might start thinking about managing your beginner programs. Um, clearly, it's, uh, it's an exciting, uh, time of year for uh, university programs as they're all returning to to back to their universities and the the main reason for this webinar is to sort of give you some guidance if you like around how you how you might uh, get your beginners up and running again um, and entice your new new recruits uh, back or not back uh, in, into the sport um, as I say, it's an exciting time, and we have we have we will have many new people taking up the sp sport. And wh where I come from first is that this is a, a sport for life, really. And um, uh, the the other speakers tonight have all been involved for a long time in the sport as well. And we we've sort of not only made it a career, but we we want to be part of uh, uh, an exciting sport. So. Um, we want uh, we want people to get the bug for our sport. Um, whether that's going to be as a, a rower, probably initially, but as whether they come through to be a coach or a captain or a secretary or even a, an umpire or a volunteer, um, it's it's a sport for life, and um, it's it's going to be a, a challenging time, as we all know at the moment. The university life is starting in a very different way. But we want to we want to expose as many people to our sport as possible. So uh, James mentioned earlier that there's a, a managing a be beginner program document, and if I just show you that there, that's a, a, a draft of that. Um, what I will do this evening is just go through some, uh, pick out some key points and expand on them, and you can then take the document and look at it uh, at your leisure. Uh, later on and uh, pick up on that. So the, the starting point is for me is uh, what is your goal or purpose of your beginner program? Um, and it should be part of a wider club program and the goals of that club. Is it a performance program where you're you're trying to develop individuals or you're trying to develop a crew? Um, is it does it have a, a a focus on small boats versus big boats. Uh, does the program ultimately feed the, the top crews in the in the club um, in in one or two years time? So the beginners start from nothing, but you've probably got people in in your club that have been there for two or three years rowing. Uh, it is the aim to win at Bucks Regatta, or uh, as I understand, there's a, a few of you from Cam Oxford and Cambridge Colleges. Is it to just do well at at college bumps, for example, um, the or are you a program that is really just about participation, uh, a bit more of a social program that provides the rower with uh, with part of the the wider student experience? Um, 
one of the key bits for for all of this is is how you retain people after year one. Um, what we tend to find is that uh, there are there's a lot of interest uh, for people to take up the sport when they when they come to university. Um, it's a sport that many have never had the opportunity to try while at school. Uh, it's something completely different, um, but it does require access to water and does require some equipment. Um, and that's those are often the reasons why uh, people haven't taken the taken the sport up earlier in in their careers. So that it's a it's a new sport for a lot of people. Um, they've never had the opportunity, and um, for from a purely selfish point of view, uh, you know, as my role as chief coach for under 23s and juniors, um, we're always looking for uh, new stars to come through and uh, to give you everybody a, a, a sort of an understanding. Approximately 25 percent, 20 to 25 percent of our Olympic teams over the last few Olympiads have, have come from rowers that started rowing at university. So. Um, my my job is to to perhaps publicize that and make sure that you as coaches or volunteers in your programs um uh are, are hunting out those those potential olympic champions as well so i'll come back to that a bit a bit later on um so the the document that i'm sort of giving some key points from is is really there to guide um novice captains, uh, volunteers who run those programs and give them some food for thought on on how you might run your programs. One of the one of the challenges with a novice program is that the, the novice captain or the person in charge of, of the novice rowing is probably somebody that came through the novice program the previous year, uh, who was taught by the previous novice captain from the year before that and the year before that. So yeah, knowledge knowledge can get distorted sometimes. So this document is here to perhaps be available to to pass on to the next uh, generation of novice captains and novice coaches as well. Um, one of the, one of the things we do have at British Rowing is a number of resources that you can use to help you so that the the knowledge base is maintained at, at a high enough level uh, and that sort of myths. Uh, are don't don't just drift through a, a novice program. Um, so once once you've got people hooked into uh, into the sport, um, that's that's the key bit really is how you get them hooked first. So the you've you're going to take them out in a boat and they're going to get a bit excited because it's it's a new and exciting sport. But uh, I want to just um, just sort of give you some tips really on, on how I feel that you should approach this. Um, I think the key to me is to build up the boat skills first so that they, they are safe uh, on the water and that they learn good stick skills from right from the start. Uh, and uh, I signpost you to the Rower Development Guide which is available on the uh, uh, on the British Rowing website, um, and James, I'm sure, will speak about that a bit later as well. So the the Row Development Guide gives you some guidelines on the various steps in terms of developing uh, an athlete in uh, first into the sport, uh, and then as they go through sort of year one, year two of the sport. My I would encourage you to use the water time to to develop the skills well and use the land training to develop athleticism and fitness um, what you'll find is many of the people that do come and take up the sport are people that perhaps don't have a history of of athletic training um, and may not have done uh, a lot of athletic training through their school careers they are uh, they might have poor core stability um they might not actually be able to run very far at all um or, or really don't enjoy running and things like that but so i'd ask you to to sort of develop the athletic athleticism and fitness on the land um the the sort of 
floppy 18 year old coming in straight from school to university is somebody who who needs a bit of development athletically as well as just getting the excitement of of being on the water um the ergo the ergometer is clearly a uh, a tool that people use in our sport um what i would say there is use again use the ergo to develop good technique and good movement patterns, like unlike any other sport. Um, we want good athletic movement patterns and um, we don't want to start with bad technique. So again, the ergo can be used uh, as a training tool a lot of the time, um, but a, lo a lot of the time it's, it's developing bad technique. So early on, use the ergo sparingly and use it in a way that enhances uh, the development of good technique. Um, once you've got the, the hook in, uh, then you, you've got to keep the hook in. You've, once you've got them hooked into the sport, you've got to keep them there. And that's that's the big challenge now, um, particularly in in the in the year that we're we're dealing with coming forward. Um, you. There are times when perhaps there are reading weeks um, available and there are uh, holidays and those are times where you might want to plan extra extra type sessions to to sort of speed up the learning process if you like um, an easter camp is something to 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 really think about when you get to sort of the end of term two or uh, uh, April time uh, and that's a time where perhaps you can do more water sessions on an Easter camp uh, and excite them for the for the fun racing in, in the regatta season um, keeping them in the sport is a bit of a, a theme here once we've got them and there are various sort of transition point times when um, you have to think of you you need to make sure you're completely on top of this with your planning um the the big one to me is that uh we have get a lot of young young people coming in and doing being part of a beginner program and that often takes them through to bucks regatta or the may bumps uh and then we and then we tend to lose a big cohort and they don't transfer in or transition into year two in the program so have a think, please, around how you're going to transition them uh, from year one into year two and into the, the senior part of the club. The, the, the critical points in the year to me uh, are that there are both positive and negative ones. Uh, on, the, on the sort of negative, we'll start with the negative ones first. Exams crop up in May generally. Um, the weather or the lack of rowing time can, can influence the decision making by young people. And the opportunities post Bucks um, regatta or the, or the May bumps, again, creates challenges at times um, for, for people to stay in the sport. And, and then universities break for summer holidays. So um, how, how, do you, how do you keep them there? And what are the positives for for those people coming into the sport and em emphasizing these when uh, when they when you've got them got that got them hooked in. Uh, for example, to me, the exam period can be turned around. It rather than being a, a negative time, it's a and it's a, it's a time to expose them to the freedom of moving a small boat if you haven't done that earlier in the in the year already. Uh, the weather's generally a bit kinder, and there's an opportunity for them to get out in a single skull, hopefully, or a pair or a double, uh, and, and learn more about the sport and more of the sk skills about the sport. And if you're doing that through the exam period, that's a time when they're not, not dependent on, on other people so much. Um, I think it's worth uh, referencing the, when they're going through the, the cold and uh, hard and dark winter months, that the racing at, coming out at the other end is is the exciting bit of going to a big regatta um, like Bucks Regatta or uh, a local river regatta or one of the other big regattas uh, on the multi-lane courses uh, either at Strathclyde Park, Nottingham or Dorney. Um, 
rowing is also a, a massive team sport. Although you're sort of an individual in it when you come to, to being tested and assessed, uh, I think the, that we shouldn't underestimate the, 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 the teamwork that's required in the sport and the, the opportunities that creates post-university for careers and job openings. Um, it's always been said to me that uh, by sort of employers um, that you know they're looking for people that are organized that know how to be part of a team uh, committed to hard work uh, all those things are are relevant to our sport and um, make, make make the sport make make the sport what it is and it, and exciting what they what it is i think the other bit is as you approach the summer holidays is signpost them to local clubs um, not just at the summer holidays at christmas time and easter time but particularly the summer holidays where there's a long vacation for university students is sort of make that effort to help them with that transition from year one to year two. And the, la the last bit uh, for that I want to go back to is the bit we talked, I mentioned right at the beginning of you know, 25, 20 to 25% of our Olympic teams have started rowing at university. So what happens if you do find a potential Olympian? Well, the, f the first thing to, to, to say is that we want them to enjoy the sport first and make sure they stay in the sport. Um, it does take time. Um, an exceptional person may make it to under 23 uh, world championship team level in three to four years, but that, that is the exception rather than the rule. Uh, and generally it takes a bit longer. So your university club may not reap the, the benefit um, while they're still at university, but you have the opportunity to sow the right technical seeds um, while they are at university and that the impact that you have in running your programs and delivering good technical coaching um, will mean that ultimately, even if they do make international level once they've left university, you will still, as a university, have, have the bragging rights of you, you're the person that started that person on their journey uh, to, to start them on the international stage. Uh, as I said, it, it takes time. There are, there are no shortcuts in this and patience uh, for, a, for a potential uh, Olympian takes time and, it, and is, is a prerequisite really. Um, the knowledge is there available to help you and James will outline a bit later on in this webinar around the um, student development program that we run for, for potential uh, uh, Olympians. Um, what to look for, what to look for in, in that long-term potential? Well, the easy bit is to, to overlook the big clumsy 18-year-old who turns up at your Freshers' Fair, which I appreciate may be an online Freshers' Fair this year. So have a way of capturing anthropometric data um, if, if that is online. So the, the big clumsy 18 year old who isn't yet mature um, physically uh, and mentally in many cases is one that you need to not neglect um, while, they, you know, while they perhaps are a bit clumsy and in a boat when they first start. If they've got good levers, um, uh, you need to sort of look after them. They're your, they're potentially your gold dust um, for your for your first cruise in two or three years time when they mature um, into to sort of 21, 22 year olds um, and develop their their physical maturity. Um, don't neglect them for the for the nimble sort of 70 kilogram males and 60 kilogram females who who might adapt very quickly to the sport because they have a, a bit more of an athletic background um, and, and pick up the skills more easily and find it find they're a bit more stable in the boat. So the, the bit about that sort of potential uh, star of the future, if you like, is um, you don't quite know where they're going to come from when you, when you first start out, uh, on, when they first start out on their journey, particularly, as I say, if they're a, a a sort of 
an 18 year old still teenager um, still developing their physical presence um, for me that's I think that's enough from me for now for this evening um, I'm happy to take any questions James um, but thank you everybody for your time uh, for this evening Thank you, Shep. Um, there's been no questions so far, but if people would like to put in questions, you can do so now. There's sometimes a bit of a delay from us speaking to us to, to you actually hearing sometimes. So we'll give it a few seconds to actually see if any questions do come in. Um, one thing I just wanted to point out for anybody on the, the webinar this evening is you can download the document Shep was talking about. It is in the handout section, which should hopefully be on the side. Of the um, of the screen, if you're on a computer, I'm not sure how that works on a phone. Unfortunately, I've not I've not done it on a phone, so I'm not sure if if you're on a if you're on an iPad or a tablet or a phone. I'm not sure how that works, but it is available if you're on a computer. If not, I will quickly demonstrate where it is on the on the uh, British Rowing website for you to find. Uh, share screen, share screen that one. So hopefully, you should be able to see the uh, British Rowing website now. To be able to find it, simply go to knowledge and it's under road development at the very bottom, universities managing a beginner program. That's where you'll be able to download that document. Shep also referred to the road development guide um, where you'll be able to get some more information at the top. I'd also think an important document to point out to everybody here, here is how, how often, which is traditionally been associated with our juniors, but uh, a year or so a year or two ago, we rewrote that document to be relevant for the whole rowing community not just our junior uh, programs so definitely take those documents and have a look at all three to access the road development guide you will need to be a british rowing member because you will have to be able to download that on the uh, row how platform but i would recommend downloading it there's a lot of very useful uh, technical documents included within it um, it's, it's a very large document and be, can be quite daunting when you first open it, but it's there to be used as a reference document for, for athletes and athletes are able to set up their individual profile as well. Um, I will just go back to see if there's any questions. There is one, I can't quite read it. So yes, there are some questions coming for you, Shep. Um, I combined the beginner men and women in eights last season from the experience, how many sessions together as the women pick it up much faster. That's not really, a, I don't know if there's a question there. Uh, sorry, I'm, re I'm reading these as I, as I pick them up. So, um, if people do not have access to ergos, what would you use as an alternative to a 2K or a 5K ergo as a baseline? Um, okay, if you, if you don't have access to ergos, then that, that might be a positive because you're not gonna teach someone some bad ergo technique. Um, you, you probably therefore got to, got to look at sort of running as a, a quanti quantifiable measure of aerobic capacity um, you know a three kilometer run or a five kilometer run um, you know we, we're in, we're a, a, a power endurance sport um, and so look, people that can run often correlate quite well to to being successful in, in a boat as well so if you have no access to an ergo then um, particularly at the moment where access to gyms is is going to be limited or time limited um, I think teaching our teaching our young people our new people to to run is a good development of their athletic athleticism overall athleticism basically yeah. the last question is in relation to organizing training in the current climate for example training group sizes i believe that's probably going to be a question which might apply more to our covid section um so i might leave that one when we when we move to our covid section later on so thank you shep uh, we'll move on to our next speaker tonight which is uh, sarah harris so sarah you can join us on thank you and i will hand over to you thank you james uh, I'm just going to really go into a little bit more detail on some of the things which um, Shep has um, talked about, particularly in terms of um, coaching. And if you find yourself as being um, the the um, perhaps the volunteer coach in your club, so this is very much aimed not at those universities who have got a professional coach or um, some professional coaching hours, but particularly those of you who find yourself in a position where 
you're coming back to um, to do some coaching where maybe you haven't had to do that in the past. So I've got 10 tips really covering that section. So the first is around who needs to help you run your sessions. So what help do you need to run your program and your sessions and where are you going to go to ask for that help? There should be local rowing knowledge that you can tap into, especially if your host club or local club has been open a little bit longer than the university club. There'll be COVID officers or COVID volunteers who can help you with your planning. And I know Paul will go on and touch, touch a bit more on this in his section. Um, asking yourself the question about how you'll deliver your program with the help that you have and not assuming that, that everybody is going to be able to come back and help this year. It's worth spending a little bit of time in the next few days checking in with those people who would normally help just to check that they are willing to come back and that they're able to come back and that they're well. <clears throat> and you might need to create some smaller groups and bubbles to manage the programme, um, which might mean that you need extra help to accommodate this. Tip two then is, is looking at the equipment that you might have and checking it's still usable, that it's still accessible and that it's easy to clean. And again, Paul will touch on that in his section. Having a clear plan for how you're going to get the equipment to and from the water is going to be key, as is encouraging everyone to bring their own gel, wipes, water bottles, etc. And how are you going to manage if you don't have the equipment to meet the government guidelines? So what are you going to be able to do to adapt your programme? Tip number three then is what space is available to you. So you might be hosted by a club or you might have your own space um, and you might have to share space with another club. Um, you might need to create some space due to indoor restrictions such as gym access. And, and I guess you can ask yourself, but is it possible to create some space for on uh, land activities such as indoor rowing and land training? Um, do you need to rethink your sessions based on the space that you've got available? And can you restrict the water space for learn to row activities? And can you zone your space so that you can cater for beginners and more experienced rowers? So tip number four then is what are you going to deliver? And of course, this will depend very much on the club, your club's goals, requirements and the limitations for your program. And as Shep alluded to earlier, start with some low intensity and enjoyable sessions to excite your rowers um, uh, and making sure that um, you know, you're exciting those that are new to the sport as well as those who are returning. And I know James will talk a bit later on about the available competition opportunities. You might need to cut your session times to ensure that everyone can get on the water uh, or carry out land training. And again, Paul will, will uh, talk about this a bit more in his, in his session. Tip five then is planning what you're going to do. And to find out whether you've got any, are there any handover plans from last year's coaches or volunteers? Um, perhaps this is the first time that you've got to create a risk management plan and um, uh, 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 James will share some links with you for some uh, online learning around how to develop a, a risk management plan. And really how long are you, uh, how long into the future are you planning for? Um, it might be that you're just planning for the uh, incoming beginners or it could be that you're planning for the whole year. Who is the group that you're working with? Is it this year's beginners or is it last year's freshers who might need a refresher because they've only actually been rowing for six months and of the six months they've been rowing, there may well have been flooding in your area. Uh, or is it that you're planning for existing rowers? And if you're working with beginners then, have you got a retention plan? Do you know how you're gonna retain people once they've tried out the sport? And also have you got a system for record keeping? Um, the Managing the Beginner Programme document that Shep talked about earlier gives you some really helpful guidance on running the first year of a beginner programme. For those um, who are going to be coaching more experienced rowers in the, in the, uh, the programme, there's the Row Development Guide, which, which James has just explained. And if you find that you're not able to get onto the water, if you go to the front page of the British Rowing website, there's um, quite a lot of tips and hints around um, the home hub, so the British Rowing Home Hub, with ideas for indoor rowing and, uh, and land training. So tip number six then is planning what you're going to do when you get to the rowing club. Uh, so don't forget there's the um, NHS COVID app, which you can download and use to check in. So check into your own club using the QR codes. 
and following the processes and procedures that are agreed in the return to rowing plan, either the plan you're putting together with your university club or perhaps the host club has um, some processes and procedures that you need to follow. Taking time for cleaning and hand washing. So these are things which we didn't have to think about six months ago, but actually do take quite a bit of time. Giving people time to catch up. So people may not have seen each other for a really long time. And also for those who are, um, you know, who, who haven't been living together, it's a, it's a social time, you know, being the social side of it is just as important. But of course we need to just be mindful of the, um, of the of the bubbles, the bubbles of six, which uh, are part of the government guidelines. And thinking about the pinch points in your session, especially when boating and coming off the water. And again, Paul will expand on this. Tip number seven then, delivering your session. We're in changing times, so it's really critical that we're adaptable to change, even during the session. And this could include having to change activities last minute due to local restrictions, people not being able to join your session for some reason or making a change due to poor weather. So do you need to modify your session to ensure social distancing or to accommodate other water users if you're in, in shared facilities? Could you run the session virtually if you need to cancel a session? And how do you instill confidence in your rowers? And we know that a lot of pools are not open at the moment. And so there is a piece of e-learning on, on our online learning platform, RowHow, which you can show to rowers uh, around the capsize drill. Tip number eight then, what do you do when you need to get off, well, sorry, what do you do when you get off the water? So there'll be procedures to follow when you come off the water, especially around cleaning and leaving equipment safe for others. So you need to allow time for this. Uh, and it might be that you need to ensure that everybody's off the water and there could be a check-in process for that. And there might be other local processes uh, and procedures and, and Paul will expand on that in his section. Tip number eight then, reviewing your session. So how are you gonna ask for feedback about the session or program? How many times did you need to change your plans and what are you gonna need to change next time? Uh, could you keep your rows connected virtually if you needed to? And what have you learned from the sessions that you've run? Um, and it's worth thinking at this point about how the session makes you feel. Are you confident or less confident around running the program? And remember, there is out, uh, help out there, whether locally through your club or your host club, regionally through your regional coaching uh, committees, and nationally through British Rowing and Bucks. So support there to help you run your programs. And then the last tip, tip number 10, is to look after yourself. Getting a, a study life rowing balance is key, and rest and recovery is really important. The key is to ensure that nobody feels pressured to row or coach if they feel unwell. And going back to the theme at the beginning of this section uh, about asking for help. And, and, the, um, and now's the time probably to form a team that can help run the programme. So there's no need for anyone to be tempted to break government guidance anytime if they're feeling unwell. It's really vital you stay well and healthy so that you can fight the infection. James, that's all I have to add. So if there's any questions, uh, I'll be happy to take any now or at the end. Well, if, if anybody would like to ask any questions of Sarah, we'll give you a few seconds to get those typed in. Um, just to show you the section where sharing, just to show you the section where Sarah mentioned the um, the online learning was on our Rohal platform. I think it's a really good space to sort of look at to find some of the online learning. When you log into Rohal, you'll be welcome with this screen. Um, you see the like lovely buttons which are opening up and um, you can see their online learning. There's the uh, information regarding the cat size drill over in the uh, over on the right side there, as well as some other uh, online mod learning modules you might find interesting that you may be unaware of as well. Things such as an introduction to coxing and steering that you might want to ask some of your coxes to be able to do, some of your beginner coxes as well as uh, risk assessment or, or things like cold water and hypothermia that you might want some of your coaches or uh, organising teams to uh, go through as well. Um, just going back to that home page as well, this would be where you find the road development guide. And one thing to point out there is, we're still waiting for questions, nobody's come up with any yet, is on that section, just giving away my uh, username, hopefully nobody's got a password though, um 
you can see uh, there with the Red Development Guide, you can see the interactive Excel document. But underneath as well, we have um, some of our basic, intermediate and advanced posters as well, which people might find useful giving advice on some exercises to be able to do. Sarah, I think I've dragged on for long enough. It doesn't seem like anybody's got any questions for you. So I will uh, stop sharing my screen there and I will hand you over to Paul. Thank you, Sarah. And uh, Paul, over to you. Thank you very much, Andrew. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Shep. Um, I have the lovely task of trying to explain to you all the rules of COVID-19 and making your club secure. So please sit comfortably and we will now begin. I can't go through everything that you need to do. Um, hopefully with you um, coming back to university, you've also had a chance to go down to your boathouses where they, you, you're fortunate to have your own and looked and worked out how you can run a COVID secure facility. Um, the latest guidance which was published today uh, currently has us in phase G, uh, which is allowing crew boats, mixed households and uh, groups outside of up to 12 people, including the coach. Uh, we hope to move to phase H on the 10th of October, which will allow uh, traditional competitions. This is obviously all subject to what is going on nationally um, and also locally. And it's very difficult for us to give advice. We can give generic advice that covers everything nationally, but the first thing you need to do is if your area goes into a lockdown or partial lockdown, is you will need to look at the advice that is coming from your local authorities, your navigational authorities as well for the waterways. Uh, some have shut down things, some haven't, some have restricted, so you will need to check with those people. Uh, first thing I would ask you to do if you haven't done so already um, is download the NHS um, QR code uh, and poster and put that up in your boathouse. Um, you can find out how to do that on page 15 of the latest guidance. Uh, that will be a great help for everybody. The other thing is, um, if you haven't done so already, and I'm not saying that this lands with one particular person, but actually create a, a group like a, a, um, a rowing, uh, rowing committee uh, for COVID and making sure that at least that group is up to date with all the latest information from the government, from the local authorities, and in uh, for universities is what your university is saying. Um, we've had several questions that have come through. Um, one of them um, was about shared facilities, and I know some universities share facilities with clubs. Um, it is your host that rules that you abide by. I know this has caused a bit of confusion with some people, but if you're being hosted by a club, then it's their rules that you, you follow. Now, whether those rules are consistent with what your university is saying is then up to you to talk to your club. Um, but what I would say for, from the beginning is look at what you normally do and then try and work out how you make it COVID secure or COVID compliant, rather than, no, we can't do that. Look at what you can do, because you can always adapt things to the way to make them COVID secure. So the other, I'll just reiterate, outside you can have up to 12 people. So you can have an eight and four people, which, nine people so there's your cots and your eight uh, you can have a coach and we put in two extra people to help get boats on and off shelves and equipment you can and this is on and i can't remember which page i put it on but for beginners you can um have people sitting still in a boat and balancing a boat 
uh, as long as you put mitigation um, in place. So you could have, everybody has a mask. Everybody could be wearing the mask when they're in the boathouse. It's up to you. That's down to you as your, um, your own risk assessment. But once you get on the water, the people that are rowing can remove their mask and put it in a plastic bag or something to keep it dry and clean. And the other people who are sitting in the boat can wear a mask and be, still be COVID secure. And you can then swap it around. So this overcomes the problem that we had in our original um, advice that once you get in the boat, you get out there and you just row rather than sitting around sitting still. So hopefully that will help you uh, to run your learn to row courses and your beginners. Um, there was another question around that. Um, what happens indoors? Right, indoors. The groups of six. Okay, you can have as many groups of six as your space will allow you to have under social distancing. That group of six does not include the coach. So the coach can move from one group of six to another group of six as long as that coach has got mitigation, as in a face mask or a shield or, or face shield or whatever. So you can have multiple groups of six in the same space if your space can accommodate it. So go and have a look at the uh, um, regulations for that. It's, um, they're in, in the, um, the guidance and it will tell you what the social distancing is. Loosening. Uh, one question that came through was loosening of regulations um, on groups inside. This is all dependent on the government's advice. Um, once they see a downturn in the um, infection rate, then I would expect that to be loosened, the, those restrictions to be lifted. But until that happens, I cannot see that being done um, in the near future. Local rules, lockdown rules. Um, as I said before, we can pr provide generic advice for the uh, for the country, but you will need to double check if your area goes into lockdown what you can do and what you can't do. Um, we can answer, we can help you, and if you want to send your questions into club support at British at BritishRowing.org, then myself and my team will be able to help you understand or try and understand the, the local rules and how you could possibly um, still continue your activities. In most cases, organised sport, which is what we are, has been pretty much exempt from any of the um, precautions and um, uh, new rules. So hopefully that will continue um, as long and that is down to how we operate within our clubs. So it's down to how people follow the procedures that you lay down. And you may need to look at different things within those procedures in the sense of, Sarah mentioned, uh, an awful lot of Paul will talk, talk about this in his bit is cleaning equipment between sessions. So quite often you will leave a boat on the water, but you need to need time now to, for it to be cleaned for the next group of people to get into that boat. The um, cleaning of equipment before and after sessions, uh, as in um, lots of clubs uh, have already turned around and got regimes in place. But the key thing to all of the new protocols that you put in place is clear communication and consistency of that communication. Uh, and that everybody within the club, whether you're in a shared club or in your own club, is that you are all doing the same. I know that might sound really sort of simplistic, but if you've got one group doing something slightly different to another group, then it's going to cause problems. So be consistent with what you're saying and be consistent with your communication to your members. 
I could go on and on about protocols, but it, it's down to you to find the protocols that fit your club. Uh, there are 540 clubs that um, me and my team look after, and unfortunately, I cannot write a protocol for every single one. But look at your own club and think about how you will manage those people. Um, pinch points. Sarah mentioned pinch points, and the pinch points are groups of people arriving at the club, getting on and off the water. And those are the areas. So think about how you're going to manage, especially with those enthusiastic freshers that hopefully you'll all have down. How are you going to manage them? How are you going to, are you going to give them time slots uh, to come down? Bearing in mind that you cannot, if you're doing outside activity, you've got space for 12. If you're doing inside activity, you've only got groups of six. So you need to think about this as a logistics of how do you get these people into your program. The other one is getting on and off the water. Um, if you're lucky enough to have the equipment um, to send one boat off while another boat is um, can be put on the water, then great. If not, then you've got to think about how much time do you allow for cleaning between who is cleaning the boat and how are you going to clean it so the next group can get in. So build in these time things, time extra time for these kind of uh, um, activities because it is going to take longer than you think when you first start it. Yes, it will get quicker because everybody will get used to it, but it will get um, be slow to initially um, start. All I would say is please, please go and look at the advice that we've published today. It is long, I know, but there is some really good stuff in there. There's some links to there. And also talk to your local clubs um, and, other you, and other colleges and come together with a plan not so not everybody is reinventing the wheel every time they write uh, a COVID plan. Andrew, James, that's um, it from me. Otherwise, I could be here until tomorrow morning. <laughs> well, thank you, Paul. Um, there's just a, a couple of things uh, uh, that uh, Nick Hubble, who is watching, hi Nick, um, <laughs> would like to to clarify just to, on a, a couple of points. Uh, point made, uh, Paul made just to make sure that we're being really clear on these things. So no COVID and the, all the changes in government guidance can be really confusing for everybody. Um, so just wanted to clarify that the 12 number uh, was because that that is what we had uh, approved been had been approved by DCMS as part of our team sport approval. So that's why yeah. our, our numbers were 12. Um, and the groups of six are also dependent on, upon your available space of 100 square foot. Yes. That's so right, those yes. two things also need to, that, that needs to be taken into consideration. Um, we do have a, a couple of questions that have come in. Um, so first one, so uh, can more than one eight be on the water at a time from a club if the boating times are staggered? Yes. Yeah, nice and simple question there. Um, <laughs> Next one. Uh, by the way, if we're not able to answer all, some some of these questions that are coming in, I think will require a bit more of a, a thoughtful process to respond to. So we might not answer all these questions today, but uh, we will pass the, the questions on to Paul, who will hopefully be able to respond. We should have all uh, everybody's email addresses from registration, so we will we'll, we'll get back to you if we if we're not going to answer them tonight. Um, uh, another question. It seems that the British Rowing's advice for COVID safety on the water largely depends on the crews being set early. How can novice training square with this when so much of recruitment depends on uh, A, an influx of new students coming from national or international locations, and B, students trying out the sport for a week or two before deciding whether they want to commit? Necessitating, I can't say it, necessitating frequent shifting around of crews. Does that make sense, Paul? Yes, it does. And I know exactly what they're trying. Uh, I understand that it's in the first weeks, it's very fluid in the sense of people coming in and wanting to try, don't like it, fine, great. Um, not, rowing's not for everybody. I wish it was, uh, but it's not. 
what we would ask you to do is to try and keep those groups as consistent as possible. Um, just to try and stop the cross infection that way. I know it's not always possible, but that's what we'd like to try and do is keep those groups as consistent as possible. You could manage it in any way you like, but all I'm saying is consistent groups as much as you can. Thank you, yep. Paul. Um, does outside land training still incur the group of six rule? So can ergs be pulled outside for us to train as an eight? It still um, does apply as a group of six, uh, but you can socially distance. And as long as there is a distinction between the two groups of six, yes, you can. But it's got to be in the room of six. Uh, the organized competition the organized activity bit of 12 is if you like picking up the boat putting it on the water taking off the water putting it away and um it will also as long as people stand socially distanced a debrief but i am not talking about a 45 minute debrief i'm talking about two or three minutes debrief and then people are expected to disperse into groups no bigger than six Brilliant. Thank you, Paul. And last question uh, for this section. What do you recommend cleaning equipment with, soap and water or, say, 70% alcohol? Soap and water, uh, I know, works. There is also the advice from the government, which is a uh, water to bleach mix. Um, alcohol, um, Yes, we use hand gels, but I, I could not specify which alcohol or the strength of alcohol to use because uh, rubber, different handles, different materials uh, relate, um, react differently. So I would say antibacterial spray uh, that, is, that um, covers envelope viruses. Brilliant. Thank you, Paul. Um, so we, we, we will come up, if we've got time at the end, we'll come on to any additional questions. Uh, so please feel free to sort of input there. But the last few updates from me um, as I come to uh, share my screen. I'll get that out of the way. Um, so uh, just something we want to update everybody here with important dates for Bucks coming up in the uh, coming year. So firstly, the University Indoor Rowing Series. Um, Currently, Bucks are working with us on uh, running the University Indoor Rowing Series virtually. And as far as I'm aware, this will be a single event taking part over seven days or maybe a week, showcasing different events. So that's something to be aware of. And news about that will be coming out in the next week or two. So please stay tuned to, to our news and social, social channels to uh, find more information about that. Um, Fours and Eights Head is currently planned for the 20, 20th and 21st of February, and that will be based back on the River Tyne. And something uh, I've been asked to point out as well is that there will be an offering of Beginner 1 and Beginner 2 categories this year. So that will be beginners who started last year but weren't able to necessarily complete the season with the conditions over the winter and the fact that the Nobs events at Bucks Head last year and the Regatta Nobs cancelled. So there is another opportunity for them to take part in beginner events as well. So there'll be beginner one and beginner two events. So that's something to really take note of with the Bucks events this year. The Regatta is also planned for the traditional weekend, the, the May Bank Hol first May Bank Holiday weekend for the 1st to the 3rd of February, and that will be at the National Water Sports Centre in Nottingham. If you want any more information on any of those Bucks events, they will also be up on the Bucks page as well. Um, something I'd also like to promote a bit more, uh, which Shep alluded to at the beginning of the session, is the Student Development Programme. So, this is a programme we've been running for many, many years now, but recently we've just had a, a title change now focusing on student development programme. Uh, the image is of the athletes that attended the camp in 2019. Um, so gradually been increasing the numbers, trying to diversify the number of universities that are taking part. Um, we've also recently redone the website page showing more detail about the programme. So please do have a look there. You can find it under GB Rowing Team Performance Talent. 
and there you'll have we'll showcase more information for you we're trying to be clearer about standards that we're requiring for athletes uh, to attend but also we're giving out more information there about how coaches uh, can get involved with the program as well um, we have uh, we do invite coaches along with their athletes but we also have a limited number of spaces for coaches to attend who may not have athletes um, of the standards able to attend but we still want to be able to support coaches to be able to um, learn and develop themselves as well on the camp as well so please do take a look there we've expanded the program recently or last year we did to include a winter camp so now we include two camps as part of the program and one of the one of the good things to have come out of covid is we have been forced to learn quite a lot about how to um, manage uh, quite a lot of virtual learning and virtual virtual interaction with uh, athletes and coaches on the program as well so we're going to take some of that learning into the future as well and do a bit more virtual learning and distance experience as well going into future years hopefully um, COVID restrictions will lighten so we'll actually be able to do the summer camp next year that's what I'm hoping fingers crossed anyway um, so please do check that out that will show you details on the standards and things of athletes that we're looking for um, so please do have a look there or please get in touch with me um, if anybody has any questions on that. Finally, a bit of a plug from us about uh, our webinar series that we've just announced yesterday. I think it went up on social media. So you can find all the webinars and you can register to all the webinars that are coming up. You can find that under Knowledge Online Learning and uh, there is a BR Webinars link up there. We've got a really exciting group of speakers and webinars coming up hopefully showcasing a range of different um, areas of our sport so we hope uh, you'll be able to join us for those and uh, take part and learn from some of those webinars uh, we'd be really keen on feedback and uh, other things you'd be keen to see as well so i think that is everything if the other speakers would like to to join me back on we can see if there's any more questions uh, for any of us that have come up yep yeah. Hey, there's all the other speakers. Brilliant. Um, I will also stop, stop sharing my screen. So um, if anybody would like to ask any other questions, we'll give it a few more. Uh, we'll give it another minute to, to come up. See if there's any other questions. Um, otherwise, I'm just going to keep on rambling until somebody tells me to stop, to be perfectly honest. Um, there's no other questions. At the moment we'll give everybody another minute or two it does take time but thank you everybody for attending this evening we hope you found it useful um thank you paul thank you sarah and thank you chef for all uh, joining me this evening there doesn't appear to be any questions coming in so i think we're safe for finishing um so thank you everybody again i wish you all the best of luck in this challenging season that we're going to have coming up i hope you all are able to put the necessary requirements in for your uh, COVID restrictions. I hope you're all able to stay safe and um, good luck, stay safe. Uh, hopefully we'll see you at a regatta or a head race soon. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks all.